Um, my name's Mike Jackson. And I'm Gethin Roberts. And I'm Jonathan Blake. And it's really nice to be here speaking to, from Hausman's Bookshop, um, a long-established radical and left-wing pacifist bookshop in the building which was for many, many years the home of London Lesbian and Gay Switchboard. Uh, and this is also the place, as a volunteer on Gay Switchboard, where I first met Mark Ashton, so this has a lot of resonance for, for us. The group came together in response to the British miners' strike, which has often been described as a civil war without guns. It was a huge, huge industrial dispute. There hadn't been anything like it really since the 1926 general strike. Uh, this is Margaret Thatcher's government, who were clearly uh, aiming to, to strike a mortal blow to the trade union movement in Britain. And part of what she did in that was she sequestered her government, sequestered the funds of the National Union, so that miners couldn't get at their own money, their money, which they uh, put aside specially for strikes and strike action, and the government just said, no, you can't have that, we're having it. And so that was an attempt by the Thatcher government to starve the miners back to work. So the National Union put out an appeal globally, all around the world, for anybody who supported the miners to, instead of sending money to the trade union, to actually twin with individual mining communities. And in some respects that, that, that actually worked in our benefit because it created these really uh, powerful links that probably wouldn't have existed had we been putting money into the coffers of a big trade union. So LGSM started quite late on, about three months into the strike, as a result of Mark Ashton bumping into me just around the corner from where this interview is taking place, uh, just before the 1984 Gay Pride March, and Mark said, hi Mike, how about taking some buckets and collecting for the miners at the Pride March? And I said, that's a great idea, and we did. Okay. And I think it's fairly typical that the group, when it was formed, involved both people who were already involved in politics, in trade unions and so forth, generally people who have been involved in the anti-apartheid movement and the Troops Out movement and other um, social movements, um, people involved in LGBT activism, people involved in trade unionism, um, and certainly people who were already involved, like myself, I was involved in the Labour Party, I was collecting for Tower Colliery with the Labour Party, I was involved in my trade union collecting for a, um, a colliery in, in Yorkshire and through the, uh, the Gay Sock at London School of Economics who we were collecting for a, for a pit in, uh, in Scotland. So LGSM kind of was an additional part of what I was in, I think that was the case for lots of people. But it also brought in lots of people who were simply radicalised by the strike or who were moved by the strike and really felt that watching a community being starved to death and not or starved back to work and not actually doing anything about it wasn't acceptable. So people who hadn't been involved in anything also got involved. And I think that was the case in LGSM as well. I mean, for me, it was it was somewhat different because I had just well, I had uh, eighteen months previously been diagnosed HIV positive, which was you know uh, a huge thing for me, um, and. My whole life sort of changed, I didn't know what to do. But I remember sort of, um, I had seen an advertisement for a uh, stand together around Green and Burfield and Aldermaston that was organised by this group called Gays for a Nuclear Free Future. Uh, and uh, it was going to, there was a coach that was leaving from Gays the Word. So I decided that this was going to be my sort of, my coming out um, as HIV positive. Um, I was going to sort of go and join this uh, and when I arrived uh, the first person who sort of came up to me uh, was this guy called Nigel Young and Nigel Young uh, had been a sort of political activist, he'd been a member of, uh, of Gay Left Collective um, and we just got together and we chatted and it was, it was amazing and since I was going to be dead sort of next week anything that was suggested I could just go yes, yeah that's fine and we got together and he suggested that maybe we should uh, squat together. And so we kind of got together. And it was from him that, that then sort of uh, when uh, lesbian and gay men sport minors came on the scene, it was sort of just second nature, you know, we were going to be part of it. And that's how it happened. 
and I'd been uh, I, I helped found North Staff's Gates switchboard when I was a student at uh, Hill University in '77. Uh, I've been in the Labour Party when I was a teenager, but when I started to learn about politics, I left the Labour Party. Um, <laughs> uh, um, and then when I returned to London in uh, 1980, that's when I started training to become a volunteer on Gay Switchboard, and, and that's where I met Mark. In terms of uh, how many people involved in the group, uh, it was a very kind of fluid, open organisation. Uh, people didn't really become members, you just turned up at a meeting. We had meetings every week on Sundays and we kept an attendance list. And looking back in retrospect at that, we'd have well over 100 people pass through our meetings. At its height, we would get 50 or 60 people at a meeting, which was phenomenal really. But I think with a lot of these things, not just LGSM, there was a core of activists and there's probably about 10 or 15 of us who were consistently there doing, doing things and that includes us, us three. And of course by the end of the strike, the London LGSM, the original LGSM, had inspired other groups to set and I think there were 11 LGSM groups yeah. across the country by the end of the strike. So there were other people involved in exactly the same kind of stuff. And we and the organisation was very minimal. We we deliberately did that. It was a single issue thing, really. It was about collecting money for the striking miners and supporting the striking miners. So because it was a very practical thing, we didn't need lots and lots of offices, and we deliberately made it so that we didn't have many. We had we didn't even need an official typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> we had a secretary because obviously you need a secretary. The chair was a rotating chair, so every week it'd be a different chair. And because we were in the business of collecting money, we had two treasurers and, and a press officer. Mark was a press officer. Yeah. And the two guys who were the treasurers, initially when the uh, people bring in the money that they collected the previous week to the meetings, they bring them in buckets. And it was so heavy, these guys have still got arms that are two inches longer than <laughs> they should be because their bones got stretched. <laughs> well, I'm not quite sure why we went to Wales. It was fairly random, I think. It was just a particular connection through Hugh, is that correct? Yeah. yeah. yeah so one person who was involved fairly early um, had a connection with, with Delice, and we contacted them and they responded favourably. Di Donovan came to meet group of people in, in, in London. Um, but it was done, sorry, but, but it, it was done by letter yeah. as opposed to sort of the, the, the film does this wonderful sort of telephone, but it wasn't. Yes. Uh, Michael, you wrote a letter, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, I, I wrote a letter. And I do remember when I posted the letter thinking I'd love to be a fly on the wall when that gets opened in Wales because this is 1984, attitudes are very different then. And it's really taken us 30 years to discover actually what did happen. Uh, Sean James only recently told us what happened was Hefina, who was secretary of the Miners Support Group in Wales, read our letter out amongst the week's correspondence to the group. And there were about 40 people in the Miners Welfare Hall at that meeting. And um, when she read our letter out, it was met with laughter and giggles. And then the magic happened because very quickly the laughter and giggles stopped and they asked themselves why they were laughing. So it immediately went into a discussion about sexuality, etc. And there were, they decided that they were going to extend exactly the same invitation to us as they had to all their other groups. There were a very small number of people who were uncomfortable about that idea. Uh, and I think they were told in no uncertain terms, well, that's fine for you to be uncomfortable about it, just stay away. <laughs> um, and so actually we absolutely encountered no hostility at all. The, 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 the movie is a movie, it, it has to have drama, uh, but we didn't... Uh, but there yeah, was a huge, I mean, th there was, you know, incredible nervousness. There was nervousness, Because when, yes. we, when we went down, I mean, we were what in sort of, there were, there were two... Hackney Transport, Community Transport, and I think a clapped out uh, oh, so Volkswagen camp. camper. So there must have been somewhere around about There's 30 of 27. 27. 
on on the first uh, the first visit, and we got lost. We got totally totally <laughs> lost, and we arrived I think somewhere around about one o'clock in the morning. So we had completely missed whatever was going to happen, um, and we all ended up on Di Donovan's floor. Didn't we? Yeah, yeah. So that aspect of the film is quite realistic, and I think the meeting with Di Donovan is quite realistic. I mean, he reacted in just that kind of way. Once we gone down and visit, visited people um, and we started to interact on an individual basis, I think that's when it kind of really started to, to develop. And for me, I mean, perhaps because I'm Welsh, I have a kind of romantic view of this, but I'm not sure that it worked in quite the same way with other mining communities, perhaps. This was a community which had a enormous understanding of solidarity, an enormous history of internationalism in particular. So it, it, in Uncle and Miners Welfare, where that amazing dance scene with, with Jonathan is set, you know, the, the, the Lodge Committee sat and composed a letter, uh, sorry, a telegram to Mao Tse Tung congratulating him on the completion of the Great March. You know, so this wasn't some little isolated village not knowing what was happening in the world. They'd had um, this amazing relationship with the Republican, Republicans in the Spanish Civil War uh, which was really very much triggered by an earlier incident where the coal owners had brought in um, Asturian miners um, to, as strike breakers. So these miners came from Asturias in northern Spain um, and found that they'd been brought in as strike breakers. They were anarcho syndicalists, all of them. <laughs> they joined the strike. Um, and so they were kind of welcomed into the community. So in Abacrav, where Sean you lived during the strike. I mean, there's a row of houses called Spaniard Row, which is where they originally lived. And they intermarried, and, you know, Sean has uh, cousins with names like Antonio. So you get lots of Antonio mm. Williamses and, you know, mm -hmm. Pedro James and this kind of stuff. So there's a real uh, intermingling. They used to sell uh, Spanish and Italian anarcho syndicalist magazines on the streets of those mining communities. So an enormous kind of sense of... Um, history of solidarity. And similarly, after Guernica, Wales brought in thousands of Basque children who were taken into the homes of working class people. Um, you know, the largest contingent of people uh, who joined the International Brigade were South Wales miners. Um, so there was that whole history and a real understanding of that history, knowledge of that history throughout the community. And then a bit later, there was that relationship with um, Paul Robeson, the great American singer, um, communist. And when his passport was uh, confiscated, he wasn't allowed to travel outside of the United States because of uh, being a communist. Um, he actually sang down a telegraph wire to uh, a community in, in, uh, in the Dallas Valley. Um, and. You know, he visited, he had that ongoing relationship with South Wales miners. And his son, Paul Robson Jr., came over during the strike and we had the privilege of, of meeting him when we were down there. Um, so all of that was kind of part of the reason that they really under, understood. Um, and, and it gave us common ground. I mean, once we kind of talk, start talking about that history and about that kind of politics, you know, we were amongst friends. But for me, it was also sort of... Uh you know, very special being that we were in sort of uh, in South Wales because uh, my mother was born in Swansea and she was the daughter of a, of a rabbi because there was a very big Jewish community in Meath and, and, and Swansea. Uh, so for me, it was like a, a, a coming home. But on top of that, when I was an actor, I had worked at Swansea Grand during the 1992-93 first miners' strike, and it was the first miners' strike, 72. which is 72, 72. 72, sorry, 72, 73, which was sort of, uh, that was really what galvanised Thatcher to make sure that uh, the, the 74 or the 84 strike was going to be smashed, and she had uh, made plans to do that um, way, way back, so sort of, you know, she essentially sort of encouraged the miners to work overtime uh, in order that, uh, that they could get, the government could get stockpiles. So if they had a, 
two-year strike, they would have enough coal to do it. And I think I'm right in saying that when you were an actor in Swansea appearing in Panto, John James was in the audience and saw you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was playing the slave of the lamp. <laughs> <laughs>
had no idea you people supported us. And I just put my arm around his shoulder, gestured to the one and a half thousand people there and said, well, no, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I walked away from him and he was literally gobsmacked. It was, and it, I'm sure we've got countless incidents like that, of those personal references where a life has been changed, a, th a, a way of thinking has, has changed, and it changes in seconds. It's as simple as that. I mean, one fundraising thing which I have really strong memories of, which I just mind you didn't make it into the film, we actually went, two of us went to uh, northern Italy, uh, travelling around northern Italy in a coach with a striking miners rugby 15. Uh, they played rugby and we spoke at various lesbian and gay venues in northern Italy, in, in Milano and Bologna and Ferrara and places. And I particularly remember speaking at the um, gay men's knitting circle in, in Milan Gay Centre. There were all these kind of... Um, bearded men sitting, knitting the most exotic and amazing creations while we talked about the miners' strike. Um, and we, we raised a fair bit of money, um, so that, that was kind of a real bonus. And that was extraordinary, because uh, I remember being invited to Bologna when the, uh, the film was, uh, had been uh, screened, and it was, it was actually its first outing uh, in Italy. Uh, and. Um, I was invited to, to go there and the gay centre there remembered Gethin <laughs> and the rugby Yeah, we spoke at Casa Rosa. Yeah, yeah which, was, which was just so extraordinary. So, you know, even 30 years on, the memories are still strong. And of course, sort of Bologna is uh, it's a wonderfully red city. So, uh, yeah. truly amazing. And I think for a lot of us, the first person who we knew personally who died was Mark. I mean, that kind of really brought it home to, to us. And then after that, more and more people got ill and more and more people were dying. And it, with Mark, it was just so fast. Yeah. It was incredible. It was 11 days from diagnosis to death. But uh, that was one of the things, was you know, in, in, in those days, there was so little. Um, so people would sort of present and they were already you know at what would be like sort of you know third stage um, so there was no very little warning and very little chance and of course there was nothing there was a lot of support uh, which which was extraordinary but sort of you know there was no medication well there was sort of the poison chalice of failed chemotherapy drugs um, but sort of otherwise there was there was there was nothing there was nothing and and the thatcher government it's hard to to to, to explain how iniquitous margaret thatcher and her government were they were just so evil and again they willfully neglected hiv when it first came out because they thought it only applied to gay men and uh, they didn't care about gay men and it was only really when Certain heterosexual people were starting. It was spreading into the heterosexual community. Because well, that was, but that was that was the amazing thing. Because, you know, Norman Fowler told Margaret Thatcher that there was an outbreak of uh, of HIV/AIDS in the Scottish heterosexual community, and that freaked her. What she wasn't told by him was it was in the intravenous drug users. <laughs> of because she'd have said, let them die. So that, uh, that that was why suddenly in 1986, 87, they produced this horrendous gravestone, don't die of ignorance. And, you know, the whole thing was just played with for fear, um, which was of no sort of, no help really, because what it did, it, it gave the right-wing press the chance to vilify us more, you know, that it was a gay play, that we brought it on ourselves, um, and, uh, and that we were the people that was sort of, you know, had caused all this. Uh, and it was a nightmare, and it was, a, you know, but there was a huge amount of ignorance, and there was yeah. ignorance even within our own community. Yes, and, and I mean, the only tool that was available to, to try to 
combat the epidemic was education. Yeah. Uh, and of course, Thatcher's government brought in uh, Section 28, which um, criminalised any teaching about um, gay relationships in emotional homosexuality as a pretend family relationship was the, the phrase, but effectively it um, put a stop to any kind of education happening in schools aimed at young gay men in particular, so the people who were most at risk were denied the opportunity to, to, to learn about it and let it. So the efforts will be made by people like Terence Higgins Trust and the lesbian and gay community generally um, were entirely undermined by deliberately undermined by, by Thatcher's decision to introduce Section 28 um, and thousands died because of it. And what is, you know, is so amazing is the fact that still the effect of Section 28 is still um, reverberating around schools because there is very little proper education relationship education um, for sort of, uh, well, not only for just uh, for, for heterosexuals, for, for anyone, but particularly around sort of, you know, lesbian and, and gay people, you know, there is not this discussion. And yet, what has happened, and what has happened because of the film, that there are these extraordinary pride societies that are happening within schools. I mean, unheard of, unthinkable, I mean, in my day, I mean, it would never have happened. I mean, Jonathan and I are going back to my school <laughs> next month to talk to a Pride Society that's been set up because of the film. I mean, it is extraordinary. It is extraordinary. And it's wonderful. It is, that, that is something which is just fantastic. Just going back to the mid-80s, so uh, after the strike, um, the, in the mining communities, Thatcher was doing all her damnness to make life worse for us. Meanwhile, the mining communities are collecting for HIV charities, they're, they're spreading the word, they're, they're educating people. So, you know, they were again repaying, not repaying, that's not fair, but they were, they were supporting us in the way that we supported mm. them. Yeah. The short answer, yes, I think that... The, they are, but, but, I mean, I think what is extraordinary is that I think that we're much stronger than, than we were previously. So hopefully, kind of, there will be, you know, a uh, response to that. There is already responses happening sort of uh, in the States to Trump. And I mean, you know, that was terrifying. Trump's just almost on the first day that, the, that he was in the Oval Office, he was countermanding sort of many of the sort of uh, the, the, the gay right legislation that uh, Obama had, uh, had helped to bring in. Yeah, but we're certainly seeing a kind of a rise in not only individual um, homophobic acts and the rest of it, but also kind of state sponsored homophobia. And looking at places like Turkey, um, you know, the last couple of years have been horrific and continue to be horrific. The the, um, the police attacks on the Istanbul Gay, Gay Pride March, uh, tear gassing of people. And you, know, and you go back to even just three years ago, there was a real sense of hope and optimism. Um, the Pride, the film Pride, had a real um, resonance in, in Turkey. We, we went to quite a few screenings there uh, because shortly after Gezi, there was that kind of feeling of. Optimism. The Gezi uprising was, I think, very much a similar kind of moment for the lesbian and gay community in Turkey in that they began to build these relationships with trade unionists, with um, the Kurdish movement, with Roma, Armenian, and other groups. Um, so all these marginalised groups started to um, relate to each other in a way that simply hadn't been possible. And there was a feeling of change was possible, change was in the air. Um, and of course that's now completely crushed um, and, and the situation is worse than it was four or five years ago. Um, and that's not, in Turkey not the only example, I and mean, I think you, know, you look at what's happening in Hungary um, and other, other places. Well then you look at what's happened in, uh, in Uganda. 
Well, yes. Where there is yeah. this, this complete suppression. Um, and of course, a lot of that is to do with sort of, you know, the power of the Christian church. Um, and specifically the power of American evangelicalism, certainly yes, in, yes. In, in places like Uganda. It, it is homophobia that has been whipped up by rich American evangelicals. Um, and it's just kind of horrific. But on the other hand, we have had some yeah. fantastic gains. I mean, I never would have believed in my lifetime that we'd, we'd come as far as we've come here. Uh, you know, we, we must never be complacent. You know, rights that were hard gained uh, can be easily lost if we're complacent. Um, but uh, I mean, I think now, of all the um, gay members of parliament, the Tory party actually has more out gay members of parliament than any other party. So this is <laughs> yeah, the party I that, that good it does or so. This is the party that suppressed gay rights, yeah. Section twenty eight, close twenty eight. It was Labour and ourselves who helped to overturn all that and bring us the rights that we've got. And who comes out and benefits from it? The bloody Tories. Do you know what I mean? You couldn't make it up. <laughs> and it's they, they will almost treat it like it was always the soul. You know, no bless and, and, and yeah. certainly they are pursuing an agenda which impacts disproportionately on young lesbian and gay people. So the austerity agenda has a real massive impact. Even really, you know, seemingly unrelated things like cuts in library services. It's removing one of the kind of safe, sp safe spaces where young lesbian and gay people were able to explore and find out about the sexuality and about the lesbian and gay world and so forth. Um, the cuts in health services, particularly mental health services, disproportionately impact on young lesbian and gay people because they are disproportionately affected by mental health issues. Um, housing. housing uh, Insecure work contracts, so um, zero hour contracts, and the rest of it. You know, young gay people are more likely to be estranged from their families and not to have family support networks. So, when you cut social security payments to young people, when you make it harder for them to, to, to access state benefits and then make it harder for them to have secure employment and then make it harder for them to enforce whatever rights they do have. Um, that all disproportionately affects the lesbian and gay community um, and so many with um, lesbian and gay elders, you know, we're all going to be looking at all these pension homes fairly soon and, you know, like, and where's, where's the support and um, facilities for yeah. our generation? We're not going to go into um, homophobic environments without mm. screaming and kicking, yeah. um, so, you know, something's going to change there. Well, how the movie came about, uh, I take you back to uh, 1992, uh, eight years after the big miners strike, there was a second smaller wave of pit closures under uh, Michael Heseltine, who was a minister, and when, uh, what's it called, John, John Major, John Major was Prime Minister, um, and there was a young uh, actor called Stephen Barrisford who'd got a boyfriend who was ten years older than him, and the boyfriend said, we should support the miners. And Stephen said, why on earth should we support the miners? And of course he walks into a trap because the boyfriend said, let me tell you a story. Ten minutes later, Stephen goes off to bed in a huff, thinking that this is just ridiculous, it's made up, it's a gay myth. And the boyfriend said, it's true, it happened. And that was that. And then... He spent the next few days being curious as to find out if this was true, and of course it's pre-internet, really. Uh, and he said it was very difficult to find anything, but he eventually did. What he didn't know, that actually he was living in Manchester at the time, and twice a day he was going past the People's History Museum, where, wherein our archive had been gathered, gathering dust for years and years and years. So that was a little project since Stephen said 20 years ago. Moving on, there used to be a very successful uh, British movie company called Working Titles that was bought out by Hollywood and when Hollywood bought it out it plummeted. So the call went out to that, that the ingredients of success of Working Titles 
were British actors, British subjects, set in Britain. Yeah. So that was the call out. So we, 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 and so Stephen Burrisford was called in as a promising young talent uh, to a meeting by David Livingston, the producer. And uh, that was it. David asked him if he got a story modelled on this British actors, British subjects, whatever. And Stephen couldn't think of anything. And he got up to leave the room. He had his door hand on the door handle. And David s s looked at him and said, really? Nothing? Not even something in your wildest dreams? You wouldn't ever expect to hit the silver screen? And, uh, and Stephen now says that's the best pitch he's ever learned in his life. Because he just turned to David Livingston and said, well, there is one story, but nobody's going to tell it. And of course, David Livingston said, I might. <laughs> Stephen sat down, ten minutes later, David Livingston's in tears, just saying, that's it, go away and write it. So that, that was it. Uh, and then Stephen had to try and track us down, and he saw a film, a video that we made at the time called All Out Dancing in Device, <laughs> uh, which is okay, I mean, it was an amateur thing, fine, the technology wasn't as good those days. But the thing that infuriated him about that, there were a list of names right at the end. Well, no, wait a minute, because cool. what he, he, he said was, what infuriated him was, that because it was an amateur production, there were no names underneath the talking heads. Yeah. So he had to wait until the very end when the, 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 the list of credits went up and he had to find out of this list an unusual name, basically. Um, and my, so my name being Michael Jackson, Mike Jackson that's not, she, that, not that, unusual. So that was that was not good. But happily, up came this name, Reggie Blenner Hassett. And he thought, how many Blenner Hassets can there possibly be? And by now there is Facebook. So he went to Facebook, looked, found that there was a Reggie Blenner Hassett, got in touch with him, said, were you by any chance a member of Lesbian and Gay Men's Sport Minors? And Reggie replied, yes. <laughs> and so they met and he vetted him, thought, oh, he so understands. Having, yeah, so having made that first contact, I think he then spent probably the best part of 18 months, talking to people. Yeah. So he spoke to all of us, he went down with Mike to South Wales, um, and he really got to know our story. He obviously went and looked at all the resources that were available in, in Manchester that he hadn't seen 20 years previously. Um, and at the same time as learning about it, he kind of built up relations through, through this. By the time he was ready to start writing it, we, I think, felt pretty much a great deal of trust in him. Mm. And he was very, very clear that he wasn't going to write a documentary. He wasn't going to tell the true story. He was going to dramatise it, he was going to make things up, and he was going to aim it at a mass market, at the American market. So there were things that wouldn't be included, and there would be things that varied quite a lot from reality. Um, and he also wanted to, to, to make sure that, that, that a young man's coming out was like the, the central theme. So this character, Bromley, Joe, you know, it's a totally fictitious character, but that carries the, the narrative. And I thought it was like, yeah. just amazing. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. So once he started writing, he went off and he wrote it. He didn't consult us, he didn't talk to us, we knew nothing about it um, until it was finished and it was pretty much most of the filming had been done. Michael was a bit more involved uh, and met with some of the cast at the earlier stage, but for most of us, we didn't meet them until most of the film had been done. Um, well, I, 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 I did. Oh, you were your character. Because yes. I had this yeah. extraordinary oh, sort of um, this this telephone call from uh, from Stephen saying, um, the director and the actor who's going to play you would like to meet you. Is that possible? So I said, well, when are you thinking? Well, how about tomorrow tea time? And I'm thinking tea time wow well there's just enough time to make a lemon drizzle cake yeah that's fine so it was all set up and the next day Stephen arrives <laughs> I remember sort of the doorbell goes and I go and answer it and there is Stephen standing with this this bouquet of flowers and I say oh you're going to a wedding he had roses and cabbage roses so he said no they're for you thrusting in their hand so I said well where are the others 
And he said, oh, they're at a costume fitting, they'll be along later. So I said, come in, come in. You can have tea, but no cake till they come. We're chatting, doorbell goes. This man thrusts his hand out, introduces himself as Matthew Walker's the director. And over his shoulder, I see McNulty from The Wire. And that's when I first learned that it was Dominic West. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Of course, before all this happened, Stephen has produced a, a script, and they then needed the funding to actually turn the script into a film. And eventually the, film, the script ended up on um, the desk of Cameron McCracken, uh, the managing director, I think, of um, Pathé okay. Films. And he apparently said, read the script and said, I made The Iron Lady. I need to make amends. I want this film. <laughs> so it, 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 it left working titles hands and came to Pathé UK. And I must say, once Pathé had their hands on it, it just started moving very, very quickly. Yeah. And I think the key things were getting people like um, Bill Nye and Imelda Staunton on board. And I think everybody who saw the script wanted to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. We were a bit apprehensive before we first ever saw it because Aid had been described as a rom-com uh, and Stephen had throughout told us that it probably wouldn't be as political as we might want it to be, which we kind of ac accepted. Um, but in retrospect, from that very first screening when we all went to see it together, together with the people from Wales, uh, I think it's a highly political movie, but what's clever is it's not hectoring, it's very subtle and it covers politics in all sorts of different ways. And in fact, I think, yes, you could describe it as a rom-com, but it's also a Trojan horse movie. Yeah. Yeah. People are enjoying it, they may not understand, but they're actually being politicised. I mean, I think that first time we saw it, it was just so much to take in. Because certainly, quite, quite lots of us had been extras in the film. So we'd, we'd been on set and we'd watched parts of it being made and the rest of it, and we'd been extras in parts of it. Um, so certainly for me, I was watching it and I was remembering the original events on which it was based. And then I was remembering the uh, experience of, of watching the film being made on set and um, so forth. And then the experience of actually seeing it on a screen alongside people who travelled up from South Wales and I mean, alongside lots of people yeah. from the past. It was incredibly emotional and moving. I mean, that was, for me, you know, one of the things was that, that I found it really difficult to, uh, to watch because I kind of had the weight of all those that were dead mm. on my shoulders, the people who weren't there mm. and were missing. And I remember sort of uh, finally sort of getting to the, the end of the film and then these credits go up and Stephen had written something so outrageous uh, about me and my contribution and what's there and I just thought you can't say that and I remember rushing out and saying two things Stephen I found it so difficult to watch I need to see it again <laughs> uh, but I said you can't say what you wrote about me you just can't and I was so afraid I mean this is this is the sort of thing. so arrogant you know, I was so afraid that people would see that and think that can't be true, that they would actually disregard the film on that basis. Because he basically said that, you know, I was the first person ever diagnosed with, uh, with, uh, with HIV and AIDS, and of course this is nonsense. Um, and so it wasn't until the, the premiere that I finally saw what he had written. Oh. <laughs> I was globally outed <laughs> as HIV positive. <laughs>
and decided to get involved in something. So, you know, last week at the, the, the book launch, I was chatting to somebody who'd seen the film and as a result decided to, to volunteer for Switchboard. Um, and there are lots of ways. I think you, you met people who um, had seen the film and decided to get involved in supporting the East 14 women's mm -hmm. campaign. Um, so a, a campaign around tenants' rights and so forth. So lots of people have seen the film and got involved in activism uh, because it is a film about activism and solidarity, which shows, apart from anything else, how much fun those kinds of things can be, how it changes your life. Um, and, and people are moved by it, people want, want to do things. So I think the more people know about the story, um, the better. It's important also, I think, that, you know, because the film is not um, a documentary, it's fictionalised, some more of the, the reality comes out. The fact the film shows four or five people really involved when there were close to 100. The book at least give, gives another dozen or 15 of those an opportunity to speak for themselves. And, and that's it, the thing, isn't it? It, it, it? It's given the opportunity for us to speak. Uh, and Tim was great in terms that he just was really the scribe. Mm, yeah. mm. So he wrote and then put it together. But it's our words. Mm. So it's, it's not the film, it's not the documentary, it is just the story, the story and, behind yeah, it. Yeah, and I think it's, certainly, it's not yet the definitive story either. I mean, I think there's quite a lot of stuff that hasn't been documented. Um, we're trying to document some of it on our website. Um, and we know there are quite a lot of um, students, uh, people writing PhDs that re refer to our story, people doing master's dissertations refer to. So a lot of interest, um, including academic interest now, which I think is really, really valuable. There's a, a special edition of a film journal coming out soon, isn't there, devoted to the film and our story. And all of that stuff, I think, is really, really valuable in terms of preserving the, the, the true story, um, not just of what we did in 1984, but I think also of the impact of the film in 2015. Um, I think that's kind of also worth preserving, also of kind of value and interest. Um, the, the, the McDonald's are having their first industrial action in, in Britain as, as we speak. And uh, somebody's already taken our acronym and started off lesbians and gays support the muck strikers, which is great. One final thing about the book as well, one of the things I like about it is the way that often we contradict each other in it and we've got completely different interpretations of the same thing. And, and that's reality, you know, LGSM, you know, we, we were individuals, we had conflicts and differences between each other, it's political struggle you would do, and I think that the authenticity of that is a, is a good thing. Attacked by the media, attacked by the state, know what it's like to be attacked. That's why we're here openly as lesbians and gays and as socialists, to support the miners. A victory for the miners is a victory for us all. Victory to the miners, victory to the lesbians and gays, victory to the old, victory to the young, victory to the sick, and victory to the working class. Thank you.